Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And welcome to The Vine, the online campus of the Wrightsville United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors, and I'm so glad to welcome you to this online worship service today. Our prayer is that this service will be an encouragement to you and a challenge to you in your life of Christian discipleship or that it may challenge you to consider a life of Christian discipleship. So let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I invite you now to join with me for the unison opening prayer. The words will appear on the screen, and I invite you to pray along with me. Let us pray. Lord of life, by submitting to death, you conquered the grave. By being lifted on a cross, you draw all peoples to you. By being raised from the dead, you restored to humanity all that we had lost through sin. Throughout these 50 days of Easter, we proclaim the marvelous mystery of your death and resurrection. For all praise is yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me. Me, King of my heart, Christ within me, Christ below me, Christ above me, never to part. Christ on my right hand, Christ on my left hand, Christ all around me. Shield in the strife, Christ in my sleeping, Christ in my sitting, Christ in my rising, light of my life. And now we come to the time in our service where we go before God in prayer once again. Uh, during the prayer, I'm going to pause to give you a chance to lift up individuals about whom you're concerned. And you may feel free to do so by speaking their names out or speaking their names in your heart. Let us pray. O oh God, you are a mighty God. Nothing is as great as you. You overturn evil. You hand out justice and blessing. For you, the impossible is possible. You can even make those who died live again. When you brought back Jesus from the dead, you did so to show us just how powerful you are and how much you love us. You sent the Good Shepherd to show us the way to please you. You sent the Good Shepherd to show us how to love one another. You returned Him from the dead to show us that You forgive our sinfulness and cruelty. We know You expect more from us, and You promise to be an ever-present help in time of need. And now we bring before You, Lord, the names of those we especially want to remember in prayer today by speaking their names out loud or in our hearts. Continue to guide us, O mighty God. Do not take your hand from us. Send into our lives people who are like angels to keep watch over us, to keep us from harming others or being harmed. Make us your angels, people through whom you bless others. 
Make us one people with the entire world, united by the blood and love of the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. And as Jesus taught us to pray, so now we also pray together, praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now it's time for the children's message. So this is a great time to call any nearby children and youth over to watch this video if they're not already doing so. Hey guys, I'm Pastor David and I'm here to share the children's message with you now. You know, it's a, it's a great thing to be a part of a great church, to be a part of a great church family um, like ours because in the church, you know, we care for one another and we love one another and we're there for one another. And it's just really great to be a part of a wonderful, loving church family. Now, a few years ago, I had an experience that kind of emphasized that to me. Um, I was senior pastor at the Nightdale United Methodist Church on the east side of Raleigh, and we were having graduation Sunday where we were celebrating our high school and, and uh, college graduates. And it was a great service. And after we'd recognized the high school graduates, they announced that they had a special presentation to make to me. And I tell you what, it just, it brings tears to my eyes just to even think about it to this day, to think about how much they loved and cared for their pastor me. Um, you know what they gave me? I, I still have it and I brought it with me today. They apparently were deeply concerned for my health and they wanted to make sure that I didn't get sunburn on the top of my head. So they gave me this special hat and uh, I can wear it. Let me get it together here. And I can wear this and it will help protect the top of my head so that it doesn't get sunburned. Wasn't that the sweetest gift ever? Oh my goodness. It just really meant a lot to me. But that's the kind of thing we expect in the life of a church, the life and ministry of a church. Well, Pastor Julia is going to be preaching today from the second chapter of Acts. And she's gonna be preaching about a, a description of life in the church, the very first church ever, the church in Jerusalem. And in that church, they worshiped together, they prayed together, they liked to spend time with each other and hang out at each other's uh, houses and eat together. And if someone had a need, then they were there to help each other. And that's still a good model for the church today. That's the kind of church that we want to be a part of and that we are a part of. It's the kind of church that every church should be. And there's one more thing. You can be a part of it. You can be a part of helping our church to be that kind of church by being kind to one another, by um, loving one another, by helping others in need. And when you come to church, uh, if you're able to come here for a live worship service, you can smile at everybody you see and help spread the love of Jesus. Let us pray. 
Lord God, we give you thanks for the children and youth of our church and community. We pray your blessings on them and their families. And we thank you that we can be a part of a loving, caring church where we really try to be there for one another and to help one another and to care about one another and above all, to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to get to bring you our scripture passage today. Our passage comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning at verse 42. Hear now this word. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came among everyone, because wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me now in prayer? Holy and loving God, we are longing today to hear from you. God, I pray that in this time you would give me words to speak to your people, that you would use me to speak your message. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As many of you might know, last week I was in Spain with Pastor Doug and a group of 10 others from our church. We were walking the Camino de Santiago, which is an ancient pilgrimage that leads to the tomb of the Apostle St. James. To prove that you walked the Camino, you get this really fun little passport. And as you walk, you stop along the way and get stamps from different places, coffee shops, restaurants, shops that are selling souvenirs, even a couple of roadside stands. Well, sometimes you can also get a stamp from a local church. The Camino is peppered with these little stone churches. Many of them date back even to the 12th century. These were places where pilgrims would have stopped in centuries past. They were also the worshiping communities of the little villages in the north of Spain. But we discovered something strange as we walked. Most of these little churches were shut. Our guide, who was from Italy but had lived in Spain for many years, had prepared us for this. She said that you used to be able to walk into almost any of these churches, but now they just don't have the volunteers to keep the doors open. She said that really that's the trend across Spain and Italy. Most people under about 65 don't bother with the church. Most feel that the church is irrelevant, that it doesn't have anything to say to the current world, that it's led by people who are out of touch. Beyond that, they are increasingly frustrated about the church's use of money. She pointed out all the gold in the beautiful cathedral and said that if the church wanted to engage people today, it should use that money to help people. Well, I'd love to think that this is only a trend in Europe, but here in the U.S., people are disillusioned with the church. Even the United Methodist Church has been in the news lately, and not for the work that we do feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, or loving others, but for squabbles over property. If you're feeling disillusioned by the modern church, this passage might feel like a breath of fresh air. Finally, this is it, the ideal, pure church. We just need to get back to when things were like that. If you're thinking that, you're not alone. 
In fact, throughout church history, there have been hundreds of movements about getting back to the spirit of the early church. If you Google Acts 2 Church, you'll find a church in just about every denomination on the globe. And beyond that, church planting agencies and nonprofits about strengthening churches. But the reality of the early church is a little more complicated. This passage sounds pretty great and harmonious. But just imagine this. Our passage begins by saying they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. But who is they? They are the people who just heard Peter's message at Pentecost and who received the gospel and were baptized. Apparently, that was about 3,000 people. 3,000 thousand new people in one day. Imagine having been a follower of Jesus while he walked the earth. There were the 12 disciples, but there were also others who followed him. We know specifically that there were women who financially supported Jesus and the 12. We don't know exactly how many people were following Jesus before Pentecost, but it can't have been that many. After all, it says right there in Acts 2 that when the Spirit came, they were all together in one place, in the upper room of a house. Even if they were packed in like sardines, it can't have been more than about 50 people or so. Then the Holy Spirit of God falls on them, and they pour out of the house and into a crowded town square. They start speaking and realize that everyone can understand them even though the people who are listening are from all over the world. Peter stands up and preaches the gospel, and then 3,000 people believe, are baptized, and join the church. Well, now what? They certainly aren't all going to fit in that upper room anymore. In one morning, the early church grew nearly 100 times its size. Churches almost all say that they want to grow, but the reality of growth is hard. It's inconvenient, and it requires change. Just ask Adam Hamilton, the founding pastor at the largest United Methodist Church in the world, called Church of the Resurrection, that's in Leewood, Kansas. Today, Resurrection has over 15,000 members, but that wasn't always the case. In 1990, it began with about 10 people gathered for Sunday worship at a local funeral home. After two years, they outgrew the space and needed to find a new home. They had two options. The first was a beautiful little chapel just down the street from the funeral home. The second was an elementary school gymnasium. Seems like the chapel is the obvious choice, right? The existing members loved the idea of finally getting to worship in a beautiful space that looked like a church. But the problem was that that little chapel could only hold about 50 more people than the funeral home could. With the elementary school gym, on the other hand, they would have twice the seating capacity. Adam, the pastor, got together with his leadership team, who he had been with since day one. He reminded them of the stated mission of their church, to build a Christian community where non-religious and nominally religious people are becoming deeply committed Christians. Then he asked, which new building will better serve the mission? The team realized that while their current membership would rather worship in that pretty chapel down the street, to do so would limit their growth. They would be limiting the amount of people they could engage to become deeply committed Christians. They would be comfortable, but they wouldn't be living out their purpose. And so the leadership team decided to move into the less attractive space and risked upsetting their own members for the sake of their mission. Thanks to that decision, tens of Thousands of people have become disciples through the ministry of Church of the Resurrection. I 
wonder if maybe the earliest disciples went through a similar process. The community of believers grew exponentially, and it must not have been comfortable. Growth meant change. But all of them knew their mission, given to them by Jesus himself. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Not only did the group grow incredibly fast, but it grew exponentially more diverse. Initially, the group of Jesus' followers had been all sort of from around the same area in Galilee. But now, Acts 2 verse 5 says that there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. Many had traveled to the holy city of Jerusalem for important feasts and festivals. Journeying to Jerusalem was a pilgrimage, a holy journey with a holy destination. Pentecost was a less important festival, but it was only 50 days after the most important festival, Passover. It's likely that pilgrims who made the long and difficult journey to Jerusalem for Passover would have stayed through Pentecost too. For Jesus' followers, Passover had now taken on a new meaning. It was during Passover that Jesus was crucified. Some of the people who heard Peter preach the gospel, who believed and were baptized, might have been among the group who cried, crucify him, crucify him. Peter even says, Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. <sighs> Between that group and these early disciples who'd watched Jesus be crucified and had experienced his death, how could they possibly learn to trust each other again? Beyond that, there were language differences and cultural differences. You don't have to turn many pages in the New Testament to see that these different groups start to clash. In Acts 6, just four chapters after our passage today, there's a conflict between the Christians who spoke Greek and the ones who spoke Aramaic. The ones who spoke Greek accused the ones who spoke Aramaic of not giving enough food to their widows. And in chapter 10, the whole trajectory of the Jesus movement changes because Peter realizes that God is calling Gentiles too, and not just Jews. That led to a controversy over whether the Gentile converts needed to be circumcised or follow Jewish dietary laws. There were factions arguing for different sides of the issue. Flip past Acts to the letters to the early churches and you'll find more conflicts. There were arguments over eating food that had been sacrificed to false gods, arguments over who should get to speak in worship and how they should do it. In Philippi, there were two church ladies who were at each other's throats over something. And in Corinth, one Christian was sleeping with his dad's wife. And those are just the conflicts that the early church was willing to admit and keep in the Bible. I hate to break it to you, but if you're looking for an example of the pure church, you won't find it in the Bible. Today, we can long for a church without conflict, a church where everyone agrees, a church where we're all committed to the same Bible and don't stray from the clear commands of the word of God or a church where we just accept and love everyone. It would be so much easier to have a church where we all agreed. But here's the thing. If my requirement for a church was that everyone agreed with me on every theological point and did everything exactly the way I wanted it to be done, that would no longer be the Church of Christ. That would be the Church of Julia, and it would have exactly one member. It would be so much easier 
to have a church where we all agreed. But in the Christian faith, we are very rarely asked to do the easy thing. The Christian faith is far more about love lived out in ordinary day-to-day -day relationships than it is about having all the right opinions. The test of our church isn't how pure and correct our opinions are, but how through the power of the Holy Spirit, we stay in relationship with people who don't agree with us. That brings us back to the early church. How did they make themselves work through all of these conflicts? The answer is surprising. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. Instead of keeping one foot in and one foot out while they waited to see how the tide would turn, whether things would go their way, they jumped in with two feet. What makes the early church unique isn't that they were eating together or even that they were sharing meals in their homes. Most religious or philosophical groups at the time did that. What sets the church apart is the frequency. They were meeting together every single day. The other crazy thing, they were selling their own houses and assets and giving all the proceeds to the apostles who redistributed that money so that everyone had their needs met. They sold their own houses even for the people who helped to crucify Jesus. The best church isn't the one with the best people or the best programs or the best music or even the best preaching. The best church isn't the one where everyone agrees with you. The best church is the one that you commit to. And what's the result when we do devote ourselves? When we take a leap of faith and jump in with both feet? Awe. That's what Acts 2 says. Awe came upon everyone. When we commit to this holy, blessed, broken, messy thing called Christ's church, awe will come upon us as we experience God in our midst. This is it. This is the church of Jesus Christ. This is the church that Jesus bought with his own blood. Let's be honest, there's days when that doesn't feel like a particularly good investment. But if Jesus has said that this church is worth it, then it's my job to believe him. Rachel Held Evans, a popular Christian speaker and author, has written extensively about the church. And today I want to leave you with a beautiful affirmation that she's written about church. Hear this now. This is the church. Here she is, lovely, irregular, sometimes sick and sometimes well. This is the body like no other that God has shaped and placed in the world. Jesus lives here. This is his soul's address. There is a lot to be thankful for, all things considered. She has taken a beating, the church. Every day she meets the gates of hell and she prevails. Every day she serves, stumbles, injures, and repairs. That she has healed is an underrated miracle. That she gives birth is beyond reckoning. Maybe it's time to make peace with her. Maybe it's time to embrace her, flawed as she is. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Holy and loving God, we thank you for the church. Jesus, we thank you that you gave your own blood, your own life to purchase us. God, help us to be devoted to you and to the church, even when it isn't the way that we would like it to be. We love you. 
and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go today to be the church. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may be.